Anime is an art form that lets us make our dreams manifest and explore any scenario we can imagine, no matter how wild, as though it were real. This power has taken us to the deepest depths of space, the highest heights of fantasy, and allowed us to pose many useful hypotheticals about the world we live in and the human condition. Questions like, what if war but giant robots? What if giant robots but depression? And what if depressing giant war, but not robots? Each of these bold ideas has proved vital to our very advancement as a species, but none more so than the philosophical quandary with which anime's greatest minds have been wrestling for decades. What if one square peg, but three or more square holes? Yes, today we're investigating the illustrious history of that most intellectual of anime and manga genres, the harem comedy. Traditional rom-coms are built either on a flimsy, flat foundation of wishy-washy, will-they-won't-they they tension, or on the more reliable love triangle. A story structure so rugged and durable that, given the right economic incentives, it can last for decades. For example, the one between Girl Next Door Betty Cooper, Rich Bitch Veronica Lodge, and Riverdale's most indecisive bachelor was celebrating its 40th anniversary in October 1982, when Betty and Veronica number 320 introduced Cheryl Blossom as the girl's even richier, bitchier romantic rival, and officially made Archie Andrews history's first ever harem hero. Tragically, as is so often the case with innovation in America, this was an idea ahead of its time, and in just two short years, Cheryl and her douchey brother Jason would be quietly phased out of Archie continuity, only returning in the mid-90s when the idea had already been proven out. Luckily though, as is so often the case when American industry fails its innovators, Japan was there to do it better and more. So so much more. Technically speaking, there are three adult comedy manga featuring harems that do predate Archie's innovation, but they're all conceptual prototypes at best. Osamu Tezuka's 1960 nice anthology Fusuke, for example, featured a deposed nobleman and his many, many wives, but only in one chapter and then purely as a joke. It would be years before manga writers began taking the harem concept as serious seriously as it so clearly deserves. In 1970 Almost Nice, Go Nagai's Hanape Bazooka gave its titular hero Hanape a magic penis finger that makes any woman he points at want him, in exchange for letting some demons live in his house and rail his mom and sister. And 1982's Oh Tomei Ningen, or Oh Invisible Man, plants its lonely teen lead in a house full of lovely ladies before giving him the power to turn invisible. We are getting closer to the real deal now, but both of those manga are less about romance than they are, uh, committing crimes. It would take till 1987 for all the prerequisites of a proper harem manga, a hero surrounded by viable, willing suitors, a plot driven primarily by their relationships, and, of course, a tsundere, to come together in one place. Rumiko Takahashi's Ranma Half, which ironically wasn't even conceived as a rom-com, but rather an attempt to capitalize on the martial arts manga craze kickstarted by Dragon Ball. In building its story and humor around the bickering couple of Ranma and Akane and their various romantic pursuers, Takahashi was only playing to the same strengths that made mega hits out of Urusei Yatsura and Maison Ikoku, doing action comedy her way. And with that shift in genre necessitating an increased focus on violence, it only made sense to amplify the violent comedic chaos inherent to Urusei Yatsura's iconic love triangle. So Ranma and Akane's dads arranged for them to get married, but they kinda hate each other, and she has a crush on Dr. Tofu, who in turn has caught dangerously debilitating feelings for her older sister Kasumi, and also she's being stalked by her rich senpai Tatewaki Kuno, who also has a thing for Ranma's girl half, while Kuno's even more insane gymnast sister is chasing his boy half. 
Also, Ranma accidentally got engaged to a Chinese Amazonian named Shampoo by beating her in a fight, and he's not at all accidentally engaged to Ukyo, the daughter of an Okonomiyaki chef to whom his deadbeat dad promised his hand in marriage in exchange for lunch. And each of those characters has at least one of their own stock, er, suitors. Uh, basically, everyone's trying to fuck and or fight everyone else all the time, and it's very, very funny. Still, admittedly, it's not quite everything one thinks of when I say harem anime. The ultimate driving question behind the story is who will Ranma end up with and why is it Akane? But between the magic cursed hot springs that turn people into things, the labyrinthine lore surrounding anything goes martial arts, and the entire reverse harem that's in orbit around its leading lady, Ranma's clearly not aiming for the same wish fulfillment targets as most of its descendants. The finer points of the harem formula as we know it today originated in the cult classic 1992 OVA Tenshi Moyo Ryo Oki, the tale of a hapless teen who learns that the ancient demon his family's shrine has been keeping sealed for generations is actually a sexy space pirate named Ryoko, and then they go on a bunch of fun sexy space adventures, also with his sexy alien aunt, who it would be totally normal for him to bang because they're ageless space royalty, and her younger sister. Also, they're joined by a sexy bimbo space cop and a short stack mad scientist, and that's just in the first few episodes. Tenchi seems to have a lot of Ranma DNA in it, what with the spunky contemporary teen hero who's spent his life training in martial arts and suddenly finds himself with too many love interests to handle, which is only fair considering how much Inuyasha would later end up having in common with Ryoko. Tenchi's sci-fi lore masquerading as terrestrial mythology conceit is likewise reminiscent of Dragon Ball Z, and with a cool magic system and some legitimately rad fights, it's plain to see how it fits into the storied lineage of early shonen battle anime. But at the same time, Tenchi marks a clear branching point where harem stopped being a feature of other genres and started to become their own distinctive thing. Inspired by the all-girl cast dynamics of its director's last work, Bubblegum Crisis, Tenchi puts all of its waifus in one place. Tenchi's house. It also has all of them fall for him almost instantaneously, and it uses them almost exclusively to fill its supporting cast needs, instead of giving its hero any male friends of note. As a result, even when they're not the focus of a given storyline, your best girl of choice will likely have something to do in that storyline, or at least get some significant screen time. Compared to Ranma, the focus of the series has shifted almost entirely from fights to hanging out with these characters, and also seeing their titties because anime titties move laser discs. Not that there weren't titties in Ranma, the nipple fidelity in Tenchi is just exponentially higher. And if that's a quality you, as a connoisseur of culture, look for in your anime, then you're gonna love today's sponsor, High Dive. They're an independent anime streaming service whose library is full of the kind of classic movies and OVAs I was never allowed to rent from Blockbuster back in the day. Not to mention plenty of modern anime that also know the value of, uh, highly detailed shading and line art, including venerable harems like To Love Ru and Monster Musume, completely uncensored, just as Haruhi intended. On top of that, High Dive has a built-in watch party feature that lets you enjoy these shows the way Haruhi intended, cracking wise about their goofy stories and gushing over their incredible animation with a group of intoxicated buddies. Gushing verbally. I mean, remember your con hotel room etiquette. High Dive lets you enjoy that social experience at a safe social distance and offers plenty of other great features for customizing every kind of viewing experience, all for just $4.99 a month. And best of all, by clicking the link in the doobly-doo, you and your anime watching crew can get your first 30 days absolutely free. Where was I? Right. Tenshi finally brought all the elements of a harem together in one place and showed how a story that's mostly about a dude hanging out with a bunch of hot girls could work. The TV series, Tenshi Universe, which debuted in 1995, further refined that premise and proved its mainstream viability. So naturally, through the rest of the 90s, we began to see more manga, anime, and even light novels riffing on its ideas. Though it's worth noting that Fushigi Yugi, the series 
that proved there was just as much of a market for martial arts man harems wasn't one of them. While the anime hit in 1995, the original manga dropped in 1992, the same year as Tenchi Moyo, branching off from Ranma in a different direction that ditched the contemporary setting in favor of a more pure kind of fantasy. In general, I do think it's kind of dumb to segregate harems from so-called reverse harems. Moe's Moe, no matter who it's coming from. But there are some notable differences in female gaze-oriented cuddle puddle anime compared to their male-oriented contemporaries. And a big one, stemming from Fushigi Yugi, is a general trend toward historical and fantasy settings full of hot dudes, as opposed to hot dude high schools. Like, that's kind of what Isekai was before it became, you know all this. The show's Tenchi inspired took a different route, emphasizing fantastical girls over fantastical worlds. Saber Marionette J hooked its hero up with a trio of haughty battle bots, while Ken Akamatsu's AI Love You sets its idiot savant programmer protagonist up with sexy AI girlfriends of his own creation come to life. There was also, of course, a lot of hentai. Meanwhile, in a different medium entirely, the breakout success of Tokimeki Memorial was ushering in a new golden age of visual novel dating sims that, when adapted to anime, would be a natural fit for the harem formula, but that wouldn't happen for a little while. There was also, of course, a lot of hentai. It was only a matter of time until one of those hit it big, and in April of 2000, Zebex anime adaptation of Ken Akamatsu's Love Hina did just that. With 20 million manga copies and 1 million DVDs sold in Japan alone, it was a certified sensation. And it started accruing Western fans even before its official English release, thanks to one of the first digitally distributed fan sub tracks in anime history. A lot of people loved Love Hina, and the people who loved Loved it, loved it a lot. There was merchandise for days, OVAs, soundtrack CDs, a surprisingly robust Newgrounds dating sim, and also a whole mess of official games for everything from PS1 to Dreamcast to Game Boy Color. Which makes a lot of sense, since Love Hina's big innovation with the harem genre, if you can even call it that, was to strip out all of the high-concept sci-fi and martial arts stuff in favor of a contemporary school-adjacent setting like the the one that works so well for so many dating sims. Keitaro Urashima is a Tokyo University hopeful who's already failed the entrance exams twice, but keeps studying in order to fulfill a promise to the only girl who ever kinda sorta seemed like maybe she liked him back when he was six. In case you're wondering how such a loser could end up in a harem situation in the first place, the answer is nepotism. Due to a compounding of comical misunderstandings, Keitaro, who thinks he's going to stay with his grandmother at her hot springs in near Tokyo, is instead left alone to manage it while she goes on vacation. Also, it's not even an inn anymore. It's been converted into an all-girls dormitory, still with a hot spring, which he manages to accidentally bumble his way into while everyone is using it every other episode or so. The dorm's residents include a tsundere who hits him for doing that, a samurai tsundere who threatens to murder him for it, a slutty alcoholic, and two middle school children, one of whom is a walking racial stereotype. Which stereotype? Yes. yes! Love Hina ostensibly has an overarching plot between the dangling questions of when Keitaro will finally pass his exams and who the mysterious promised girl really is. Could it be Naru, one of the other girls who's too young or old and also has the wrong hair to be her? Or maybe it's the girl with the exact same hair as Naru who pops in every few episodes to make it slightly less obvious that it's Naru. Who can say? This is a very compelling mystery. Clearly, in reality, the viewers and readers of Love Hina were here almost exclusively for the fan service and gags, with those occasional doses of that sweet Doki Doki giving them a feeling of very slight forward momentum to keep them hooked. It is pure etchy slice of life, about as minimalist an interpretation of the core harem concept as you can get, which allowed it to serve as not just an inspiration, but also a template for the many, many series that would follow it. Just about 
every trope that signifies a brain-dead, no-effort harem cash-in, the aggravatingly indecisive black hole-dense protagonist, the endless lucky accidents with violence as the invariable punchline, the constant shuffling of girls to avoid committing to real story progress, can be traced back to Love Hina's success. And while Love Hina itself was actually pretty fresh when it released, and a lot of its comedy and art do still hold up, in manga form at least, it's hard not to hold that against it, and harder to ignore how generic it feels today. Still, it set the standard, for better and worse, and as soon as the anime debuted, we started to see many, many more manga and light novels like it. And two years later, once the anime industry had time to catch up, many of those started getting animated, alongside quite a few dating sims, minus the sexy bits usually. In spring of 2002, three new harem anime hit television. 2003 gave us seven spread across winter, summer, and fall. In 2004, we got nine. And not a single anime season has gone by since without at least one harem in it, almost always more. And for every one of those, you'll find about four harem manga, of which, like, a third aren't even hentai. The genre seemed like such a sure bet to publishers that in order to get away with making a shonen battle manga in 2004, Ken Akamatsu had to smuggle his magic system and fights inside the hollowed out harem shell called Negima. Ironic, given where all this started. With all these different series being made at once, they each needed to do something different to stand out from the pack. A few experimented with genre fusions. There was a Phantom Thief harem, a Sentai Heroine harem, a Pokemon Battle Royale, but instead of monsters, it's hot people harem. Sekirei's pretty fucking great, actually. And, of course, plenty of other horny shonen battle type things. Mostly, though, the harems of the mid-2000s set themselves apart by catering to different fetishes, either through their costume designs or, more commonly, their girl concepts. Throughout the 2000s, we saw Harry Potter magic school harems, Scooby-Doo ghoul school harems, Buddhist monk trainee harems, princess harems, angel and demon harems, cat girl harems, alien slave harems, alien cat girl harems, alien demon harems, alien angel harems, alien reverse isekai harems. Tenchi still clearly had a lot of sway, but gimmicks were the name of the millennial harem metagame. That started to change around 2011, as the anime industry's general move toward light novel adaptations also began affecting harem anime. Titles like Is This a Zombie, or Ashura, and Haganai placed interesting character dynamics over more basic thematic gimmicks, while the familiar of Zero, Infinite Stratos, and High School DxD were more about exploring interesting high concepts than simply catering to fetishes. To be clear, all of those still absolutely cater to fetishes, like, a lot. But it's hard to write a novel that one can read solely for the plot. You gotta at least try to make the plot decent. That said, the success of High School DxD specifically has seemingly raised the bar for how much plot a studio can get away with putting in a half-hour TV block, and in recent years, certain harem and harem-adjacent shows have been in something of an arms race to see who can get away with the most, with next season's World's End harem poised to give even interspecies reviewers a run for its money. And High Dive happens to be a great place to research that recent trend. Just saying. Of course, the rise in light novel adaptations has also resulted in a resurgence of harem elements being folded into other, more popular genres. It's frankly weird to see a magic school prodigy, isekai hero, or pro gamer these days who doesn't have at least three girls in love with him. And no, SAO fans, Kirito being a wife guy does not change what Silica, Lisbeth, Leafa, Sinone, Alice, and Klein are. But there's nothing wrong with that. ReZero's a harem anime, too. Even in Season 1, Subaru's got Amelia, Rem, Satella, Patrash, and that tsundere bitch Julius. Also, Mushoku Tensei, which is still art, you plebeians, is also a harem, with a harem ending, even, regardless of what the MAL tags say. Okay, 
Can I get real here? I see a lot of anime fans tumbling through mental gymnastics trying to justify why this favorite series or that doesn't count as a harem. Clan Ad's not a harem anime, even though all five girls have feelings for Tomia at the same time, because it didn't happen that way in the visual novel, even though, like, we don't really count any other visual novel adaptations that way. Monogatari is not a harem, because Koyomi and Senjo Gahara start dating almost immediately, even though, just look at it. Come on, stop lying to yourselves. We do this because harems are perceived as the exclusive domain of lowbrow, B-grade pulp anime. Which, a lot of them are, to be fair, and that's fine. I love Girls Bravo! But ever since Ranma, this genre has also played host to plenty of fun, character-rich, and creatively ambitious works. The most widely watched and acclaimed TV anime romance of all time, Toradora, is a harem anime. Taiga, Minorin, and Ami all catch feelings for Ryuji by the midpoint of the series, and he shows interest in all of them, or has to try really hard not to in Ami's case. Those feelings and his feelings toward them drive almost every major plot beat, and most importantly, there's a tsundere. Look at that tsundere. You can't disagree with me. She's definitely a tsundere. Taiga's just a brilliantly realized human tsundere, because... There is space for that, even within such an oversaturated, low-effort archetype. Just like there's space for that caliber of writing, even within this oversaturated, mostly low-effort genre. Harem anime have a rich history, a culture that more people should appreciate. So, so much culture. We're absolutely drowning in culture over here. And plot. Don't forget the plot. But also, harems have given us some of the richest, most iconic casts of characters and funniest jokes in all of anime. And we shouldn't be ashamed to say, Toradora's a harem anime, and I fucking love it. Clan Ad's a harem anime, and it changed my life. Or Girls Bravo is a tour de force debut from one of anime's most interesting and visionary directors, and I don't think people give it nearly enough credit. No? I'm gonna have to justify that one? Okay, you're on. Not sure when, but you're on. For now, though, that's about all the harem anime history and love Hina shade I got to give. I got some Maburaho shade if you're interested. Like, a lot, but no. No, that can wait, too. We've learned all that we really needed to today. When harem, how harem, and a little bit of why harem. Also, we saw some titties. I mean, I did. They're not in the video. I want it to stay monetized. But I did give you some good leads on where to look. And you can thank me with a like, comment, and subscribe. Also, by watching my new roast slash documentary series about the weird and terrible anime movies created by an actual, literal Japanese cult. I know you're very tempted to go find those anime titties immediately, but you have no idea how crazy that shit gets. Anyway, I'm Jeff Thu, hentai historian, signing out from the world's greasiest library.